Our two presenters today are Travis Rector and Dylan Watts. Those are all students in, Tra in uh, Travis's classes who are looking to get good grades this semester. <laughs> Travis uh, works at UAA as a professor of physics and astronomy. Um, he's going to start off talking about the physics of snow, you know. Water takes a lot of different forms, snow, rain, glaciers, black ice on the roads, mist, clouds, oceans. Um, and so there are difference be differences between all of those. He's going to talk about, you know, water as snowflakes. And then he's going to segue right into Dylan, who's going to talk about the fast skiing part of our presentation. He has been uh, a ski racer since he was a kid here in Alaska. He coaches skiing at APU, the community groups, and there are a lot of factors that can help contribute to skiing faster. I doubt if one of them is having to shave your legs. <laughs> like swimmers, but I'm curious to find out what they are. So, I think Travis is going to start off, and then Bill is going to follow. When we're done, we're open for questions, so will the presenters please repeat or summarize the questions before they answer them so everybody knows what the question is. Thanks. talking about how snow forms, why it behaves the way it does, why it's the most freaking awesome substance on Earth. And Dylan's going to tell you about how to go fast on it. And as an added bonus, he's going to give you the wax rack for the 2014 Tour of Anchorage. Today, you'll know what to do. So first off, to understand what snow does, you have to think about things on a microscopic level. In fact, a lot of things we're going to talk about is best understood thinking microscopically. And to understand how snow works, you need to understand how water works. The water molecule is a bent molecule that consists of a single oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms attached to it. And it also has what are called free electrons attached to the side. These free electrons push on the hydrogen atoms and cause the molecule to be bent. And this has several important consequences. One important consequence is, is the molecule is what's called polar. And what that means is, is that the oxygen atom from one atom is actually attracted to the hydrogen atoms from the other atom. So it's a little salacious what they're trying to do here. But these molecules are attracted to each other, and this is very important for a couple of reasons. The first is, is they weren't, because they're attracted to each other, they stick together. And if this didn't happen, we would have no liquid water on the surface of the Earth. We wouldn't be here to talk about it. So the fact that water is a bent molecule is very important because it keeps things together. Otherwise, water would be in the form of a gas. This is what it looks like inside water. This is an artist's conception. And again, all the water molecules are held together by what are called hydrogen bonds, where the white dots here are attracted to the, to the oxygen atoms. And another important thing that happens with water is that when it freezes, it expands. And I'm sure you've all had this experience to leave a bottle of beer in your car overnight in the winter. You come out and you now have a very expensive and messy ice pop sitting inside your car. Water is one of the few substances that actually expands as it gets colder. Most things contract when they get colder. So as a result, ice actually floats. And this is also very important because when water freezes, it stays on the top. And otherwise, lakes would freeze solid, and everything inside would be dead, and that would also be bad for life here on Earth. When water freezes, it takes on this interesting structure right here, 
that is essentially layers of these somewhat hexagonal shapes. It's not a perfect hexagon. What I want to show you now is just a little bit of a, a demonstration of what that looks like. So over here is a series of water molecules. Again, the red dots are the hydrogen are the oxygen atoms, and you see these sticks which, re which represent the hydrogens that are attached. And you'll notice that it's spinning, and most of the time it just looks like kind of a random mess, but every so often you'll notice the alignment, like right now, there, again, and you'll notice the hexagonal shape. So when the water molecules slow down and freeze into ice, you get this hexagonal shape, and that's actually where the structure of snow comes from. That's why most snow molecules uh, have uh, six sides. Another cool thing, as, as is on the quiz, was the microwave oven wouldn't work if it wasn't for the bent shape of water. So we have several great things that come out of the, the fact that water is bent. We have liquid water on Earth, we have life, we have snow, we have ice that floats, and we have the microwave oven. Which of those you think is the most important? I'll leave for you to decide. Uh, I'm going to go with the snow, personally. Oh, and the life being here on, on this, too, that's also important. So how does a snowflake form? Well, as uh, on the quiz we had a question, snowflakes actually begin with a particle of dust. And what happens is, is you have these particles of dust up in the clouds at high altitude. And in these clouds you have water vapor, which is in the form of a gas, and then you also have liquid drops of water. And once it starts to get cold enough, that water vapor will start to stick, or otherwise known as condensation, and it'll start to stick to the dust particles. We've all experienced condensation here on our windshields in Alaska. Uh, and this is actually how snow starts as well. And then what happens is you get more and more water molecules sticking to that dust particle and that ice, and then it starts forming these hexagonal shapes. So again, this is just an artist's conception of what it looks like with all those water molecules stacked up. These two pictures are the same thing, it's just seen at slightly different angles, so you can see the sheets. So the molecule starts to form bigger and bigger, and you get what's called crystalline ice. And here's a picture of what that crystalline ice looks like. Uh, the word facet was used earlier, and here you are. So what you get is, in these clouds, you'll get these what are called hexagonal prisms, which are these very tiny chunks of ice, which have a flat hexagonal side, and then you have what are called the prism facets on the side. So this is an artist's conception, and here's a picture of what it actually looks like. And this is the starting point for when all snowflakes begin to form. So there's dust inside, the water freezes, and then this is what starts falling out of the cloud to actually become the snowflake. So one way to visualize it is you can imagine what's called, this is called a Coke snowflake, not the same thing as Bill Coke, this is a different Coke. And imagine you had something where you had like a triangle or a prism, a hexagonal, and then it starts growing what's called iterative, where it keeps repeating the same growth on all sides. And this is essentially how snowflakes grow, is that as the snowflake is falling through the air, it's collecting water vapor and it starts to get bigger. So this is a mathematical representation. This is a time-lapse movie of it actually happening inside a lab. So what you're seeing here is there's a needle, and as the ice starts to grow, the water vapor freezes onto the snowflakes and it starts to grow on all sides. So what's happening is as the snowflake is falling down through the air, it is collecting water vapor and starting to grow. There are an innumerable different number of types of snowflakes. Uh, this classification scheme, uh, which you can see at snowcrystals.com, shows many of the different kinds that there are. And I'm not going to talk about all 41 of these. Um, but I am going to talk about some of the cooler ones that we see here, uh, especially in Anchorage. Now, which kind of snowflake you get depends on what the conditions are like when the snowflake forms. As the snowflake is falling through the air, it is collecting moisture and it starts to grow. And which type of these snowflakes that it becomes depends on two things. It depends on the temperature, and you can see along here what the snow looks like is colder on the right and warmer on the left. And it also depends essentially on the humidity. And so an easy way to visualize this is, is the more complex snowflakes form when it's more humid. And that's simply because there's more water vapor. So as it's falling through the air, it can collect more and develop these more complicated shapes. 
It also depends on what's called the history of the snowflake. As the snowflake is falling, it's passing through many different areas of the atmosphere that are at varying temperatures and humidity, and that's why each snowflake comes out looking different. So here are some examples. Uh, the most common form, the most basic form, is what's called the hexagonal prism. This is, again, uh, what you actually see uh, when a snowflake first starts. It's the most basic shape. This is what's called a flat hexagonal prism. It's looked on from the top. And this is one that's more of a column as you see it from the side. And you'll often see these little indents and wedges and things like that. And those are actually the parts where this snowflake, if the conditions were right, would start to turn into what we would call a stellar plate. A stellar plate is when those indents and edges start to grow snowflakes out on the edges. And we start to see a snowflake that looks very familiar to us. This is one we see here in Anchorage a lot. And it starts to form roughly around 28 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And it also will form at much colder temperatures as well. So here's another example. And you can see the variation in them. Here's another one that we see occasionally here in Anchorage. This is called a sectored plate. It looks basically like a pie with the slices in it. And then this is what's called a stellar dendrite. And this is uh, what we all think of when we think of a snowflake, right? So again, you have a hexagonal prism starting here in the middle. And then you get the growth of the branches out. This snowflake is much larger uh, than the ones I've showed you before. And these are the ones that we often see falling on our sleeves. They're about two to four millimeters in size, so about a quarter of an inch. So if you have the conditions are just right, you'll see these falling on your sleeves. And they can get amazingly complicated. I think it's particularly amazing. And then there's also what are known as fern stellar dendrites. And the, basically the difference between them is this one's just more complicated. You get, again, this iterative process where more and more branches start to appear. Little column shapes where you get these bubbles inside. And what I think is really beautiful about them is, is that you hear some examples that look pretty symmetrical. You also get these types that are cap, called cap columns. And what it is, is seen from the side, it looks like a hexagonal prism, but then on both sides, you get a snowflake stuck on top. And then this is what allows you to have what's actually a 12-sided snow crystal. And it's hard, it's a little bit hard to see here, but basically what you have is a capped column here, and then there's a slight twist in it. So you have one snowflake stuck on top, and then another underneath that's twisted just a little bit. So you can actually have 12-sided snow crystals. This is what's called rime snow, and rime snow is a type of snow that forms uh, in very wet conditions. And you can see that stuck to the snowflake are all these little water droplets. And if you've ever wondered why the artificial snow uh, just kind of feels different, this is why. This is what it looks like on a macroscopic scale. The way artificial snow is made is you shoot water vapor out with a high pressure, and then it expands and cools, and then it falls out. So it's basically just water droplets. Uh, that freeze like this, so it's very different. Now you've also probably heard of what's called corn snow. And corn snow is basically what happens to snow as it gets old. So this is a schematic showing what a snowflake might look like right after it's fallen, zero days after it's fallen. And then over time, the snowflake gets more and more withered. And eventually, after about a month or so, you just have these little pellets. So as Dylan will talk more about here in a few minutes, um, if you look at a box of wax, it'll tell you what, you know, depending on what kind of snow is, new snow, corn snow, this is why. It's because the snow changes over time. So here are some questions that people often ask. Uh, probably the most common one is, uh, are there no two identical snowflakes? And the answer is yes, there are no two identical snowflakes, but it's really not that profound a thing. It's like saying, are there two identical people in the world? No, of course not. Uh, snowflakes can get very complicated, and again, it's because the snowflake, as it's falling through the air, is passing through different uh, areas of temperature and humidity, and so each snowflake, since it takes a different path, uh, will develop differently. One thing I think is really interesting is as a snowflake is falling, it can take up to an hour from when it first starts to form to when it actually gets to the ground. So during that time, the snowflake can form differently. Are snowflakes symmetric? No. Most of the pictures you see of snowflakes are of the really exceptional ones, the ones that look beautiful. Here's an example of a snowflake 
that's more typical, and you can see that it isn't symmetric at all. So one of the common questions, can it be too cold for snow? Technically, no, but what happens is, as it starts to get really cold, the humidity drops to a point where basically there's almost no water vapor in the atmosphere. So, like in the interior of Alaska, you often hear about how if they don't get their snow early, they may not get any snow at all. And that's because, as it gets cold, the water vapor starts to fall out of snow, and it will basically all fall out before it gets to the very cold areas. Does climate change mean less snow? Not necessarily, and in fact, climate change can put more energy into weather, which can help drive more water vapor into the atmosphere and actually increase the amount of snow that we have. It seemed like a good thing, but in the long term it's not. Another question people ask is, when a snowflake melts and then refreezes, will it have the same shape it had before? And the answer is no. It'll just look like a pellet of ice. You may have heard of this thing called water memory. It's not real. <laughs> so now what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about a subject called tribology. Does anyone know what tribology is? Yes, we have an engineer over here. He knows what tribology is. So tribology is the study of friction. And it's a full-fledged field. If you think about why does your engine not blow up every time you turn it on, it's because of the oil inside it, which makes things slippery. So slippery is essentially the same way as saying there's low friction. So how can something be slippery? Well, if something has a high compression strength, meaning if you were to push down on it hard, it would not give way, but it has what's called a low shear strength, which means if you pushed on the side, it would give away very easily. And an easy example of that is ball bearings. If you were to try to walk on ball bearings, a very bad idea. The ball bearings will hold you up vertically, but they won't hold you up horizontally. And that leads us to snow. Why is snow and ice slippery? And I'm going to turn it over to Dylan, who is now going to tell you about why snow and ice is slippery.